everyone. Today, we will present some results from our recent paper, Rescuing Constraints on Modified Gravity Through Relativistic Distortions in Large Scale Structure. Our objective is to send a strong cautionary message to the cosmology community seeking to constrain gravity modifications through observations of large scale structure. In fact, we demonstrate that one of the standard assumptions that are made in these studies is actually restrictive, but fear not, because we will also show that there is a clear way to recover time constraints. But let's start from the beginning. Cosmologists are interested in verifying the laws of gravity on large scales. So in order to do this, they start from the fundamental equations of general relativity, namely the Poisson equation and the Euler equation. The Poisson equation describes the way in which matter clusters, whereas the Euler equation encodes the way in which matter falls into gravitational potentials, and thus encodes the so-called weak equivalence principle. The standard way to parameterize gravity modifications is to assume that the Euler equation is tested and thus unmodified. And then the modifications enter the Poisson equation, which is modified in a phenomenological way by including a parameter mu on the right-hand side of this equation and by changing the field that is involved in this equation. Now, combining these two equations together with the continuity equation, it is possible to derive an evolution equation for the matter density fluctuation delta. And we notice that the modification mu clearly enters the last term in this equation. However, in this derivation, we have made the very restrictive assumption that the WEP is valid. And this is actually an assumption that has not been tested for the unknown dark matter component. And in fact, in several modified gravity theories, this assumption does not hold. And this can be parameterized by including a source term on the right-hand side of this equation, which we call E break, which in the simplest scenario of an additional degree of freedom, which is not minimally coupled to dark matter, contains two terms. On one hand, we have a term that contains a parameter theta that corresponds to friction acting on dark matter. And we then have a second term that contains a parameter gamma that encodes a fifth force acting on dark matter. Now, these modifications directly enter the evolution equation. So there is an additional term plus theta here and a factor gamma plus one here. So they directly affect the way in which structures grow in the universe. And in particular, we notice that there is a degeneracy between the parameter gamma and the modification to the Poisson equation mu. So how do we connect these parameters to observations? For that purpose, we can use observations of the galaxy number count fluctuation. It consists out of two dominant terms. The first one connects it to the matter density fluctuation via the galaxy bias E, whereas the second term is the very well-known Ratchet space distortion term. In practice, we measure the two-point correlation function of galaxies. It can be expanded into a monopole, a quadrupole, and a hexadecapole. So what do these multipoles depend on? For us, the redshift space distortion term is relevant. And from that, we find that there is a dependence on the growth rate f in combination with the matter fluctuation amplitude. So RSD surveys can measure this parameter combination, which we call tilde f. And the interesting thing is that this parameter tilde f encodes the impact of modified theories of gravity. Indeed, it can be connected to our parameters mu, theta and gamma via the evolution equation for delta that we have seen before. So RSD surveys can, in principle, find constraints on these parameters, but as we will see next, there are a lot of degeneracies here. We took the current measurements of tilde f from the completed SDSS4 survey 
and we translated this into constraints on our parameters. First, the red curve here corresponds to the case where we only allow mu to vary. So this is the restricted case where we assume that the weak equivalence principle is valid for the dark matter component. And indeed, in this case, we recover very tight constraints on the parameter mu0, which, um, which is deviation from the value of 1 today. Now, what happens if we relax this restricted assumption? Actually, two things happen. First of all, we cannot constrain the parameter mu0 alone anymore. We can only constrain the combination mu0 plus gamma0. And these two parameters are completely degenerate in the evolution equation for delta. And then we see that the constraints on the combined parameter are a lot worse than the constraints on mu0 in the previous case. And the reason for that is clearly visible from the left plot. There is additionally a very strong degeneracy with a friction parameter theta. And this means that our constraints actually get by a factor 30 worse. Now the question is, can we save our constraints? Indeed we can, as in all good plays, there is a deus ex machina who saves the situation and allows us to recover tight constraints on modification to general relativity. And in our case, this savior is the effect of gravitational redshift. So gravitational redshift is an effect which has been predicted by Einstein and which tells us that if we look at a galaxy which is sitting inside a gravitational potential well, then the light emitted by this galaxy has to come, climb out of the potential to reach the observer. And by doing that, the photons lose energy. So it means that the spectrum of this galaxy is slightly shifted to the red due to the presence of this gravitational potential. And this effect is very powerful to test for deviations from general relativity because it is sensitive to the time distortion associated with this gravitational potential. Now, as you can well imagine, this effect is actually tiny. It's much smaller than the redshift due to the expansion of the universe and also much smaller than the Doppler redshift, which is due to the velocity of the galaxy, which generates the measured redshift space distortion. So if we want to use this gravitational redshift to test for deviations from general relativity, we need a way to isolate this contribution from the other contribution. And we can do that by splitting our population of galaxy into two populations, a bright population, and a faint population. And then we can look at the cross-correlation between these two populations of galaxies, and in particular, if we look for a dipole in this cross-correlation, we will be able to isolate the contribution from gravitational energy. So we have checked, and this dipole is actually too tiny to be observable with current survey, but the good news is that with the coming generation of survey, like DESI and the Square Kilometer Array, this dipole will be detectable with a high signal to noise. So what we did in our work is to study how the constraints on modified gravity, on this modified gravity parameter, change if on top of the standard redshift space distortion multiple, we add a measurement of this dipole into the game. And we found, as can be seen on this plot here, that thanks to the dipole, we can break the degeneracy between the three parameters and we recover tight constraint on the three parameters individually. So the message of our work is that if we want to constrain deviations from general relativity in the most possible model-independent way, for example, without assuming the validity of the equivalence principle for dark matter, then it is crucial to extend large-scale structure analysis and to add, on top of redshift space distortion, a measurement of this dipole, which is due to relativistic effects and in particular to gravitational redshift.